Hey everybody, it's Raven here, and this is a re-upload of a video I put up last night where the sound was just too quiet, and so I'm actually redoing the video. Um, yeah, uh, this is kind of a, well, it's a very ambitious video, and it's probably not going to benefit the veteran players too much. It's more for the newer guys and maybe the intermediate players. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just go through the entire armory and uh, explain things like what this stat means, what uh, this hidden value is, and just some of the stuff that maybe isn't apparent to begin with going through the armory. And I know, I mean, this this thing is really a jungle and it's it might be hard to understand what just everything means and that's what this video is to help you understand. <clears throat> So I guess I'm just going to go section by section. Um, with the logistics section, uh, I've heard this a few times, and it's pretty self-explanatory, but when you take an infantry c um, command in a vehicle, you have to actually unload the infantry to to get them to take a zone. Just I, I've, I've heard that a couple times, so I thought I'd mention it. Uh, tank top armor I want to mention as well. Um, the whole reason of having a tank is you pay extra for that added survivability, the ability to withstand artillery shells and bombing much more effectively. And where that comes from is a tank's top armor. So you see that this particular unit has two top armor. Uh, T-80 UK has three top armor. And then um, just kind of something to be aware of, like if you have a command tank that has only one top armor, and there are a few of those, then it, it effectively has no better protection than any of these other vehicles that you might see. O only one top armor means very little protection against bombing and artillery, and so if you're buying a command tank, you really want to get more one or two top armor. And then the last thing I want to talk about for logistics is, um, well, basically there's three logistics types of units um, in terms of supply, like there's uh, the Ural, or there's like trucks, like for example, these Ural trucks. There's helicopters, like semi six and semi twenty six, and there's fobs, which are too big to supply or to show on the armory. And fobs, you have to actually call out at the start of a match, and then you can't call them out later. You can't move them. You can't replenish them. They're just a little building essentially in your in your spawn. And so there's actually a supply hierarchy where supply trucks can resupply from helicopters, and helicopters can only resupply from fobs. Supply trucks can resupply from fobs too, but this allows you to create kind of a supply line where your helicopters will go to your fob, get supplies, bring them back closer to the front lines, and then your trucks can resupply from the helicopters and then go forward to the actual front line units where maybe the helicopter would find it too dangerous to try and land. Definitely uh, experiment with supply lines. Uh, infantry, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I think I'll just begin with training. Like you see, um, get a few units up for comparison. So you see there's this training stat here which says the better trained, the more damage they deal with the given weapon. From lesser to better trained, they are militia, regular, shock, and elite. You see, so this Morskaya Pihoda 90 is shock, and these Motostrelki are regular. And uh, the main difference between the trainings is just their main weapon, their assault rifle. Training only applies to infantry, by the way. And so you see they have the same assault rifle. They have the AK-74, which uh, the Morskaya fired at 232 rounds a minute, and the Morskaya fired at 160 rounds a minute. That, that's the main, I think, benefit of, of training I, I'm not sure if it affects machine guns or not, to be honest. Um, just shock training is better than regular. It does not affect RPGs or, or any of these kind of anti-tank, anti-air weapons. Um, and then on the subject of rate of fire, like you see these Moto Strokey, they have 160 rounds per minute with one HE, and so you might think, well, those guys will do 160 damage per minute, and that's not quite right. Um, the rate of fire, it's its not completely arbitrary. It, it does have some impact. It's a, its an indication of how much damage or how quickly a unit will do damage, but it's more an indication of how quickly they drain ammo. So, for example, Moto Strokey firing 160 rounds per minute with 1,600 rounds of ammunition can fire for 10 minutes straight. It has only a vague impact on the number of damage rolls. That is, like, the dice rolls, the... 
the chances per minute to do damage, which is more like probably somewhere between 16 and 30 for a Moto Strelke. And so just kind of keep that in mind. Like, so for fast firing weapons like machine guns, assault rifles, the rate of fire is, isn't necessarily accurate, but for weapons like an RPG, it is. So for example, this Morskaya Pihota fires their RPG at 10 rounds per minute. With nine rockets, if you resupply one of their rockets while firing, then you will fire off ten in sixty seconds. That that is a true rate of fire. And same with like tanks and things like that. Um, also, on the subject of infantry weapons, there's kind of two types of machine guns. There's a, a CQC machine gun, like this RPK. See, it's got the CQC trait. It says, contrary to other machine guns, this weapon can be used in close quarters combat, meaning house to house fighting within a city block. This is as opposed to the Moto Strelke's PKM, which is static. This weapon cannot be fired on the move, and it also cannot engage in city-to-city -city fighting. What CQC is, is when you occupy a city block, it'll normally turn to your color, whether red or blue. And then if an enemy infantry squad occupies that block as well, the outline of the block turns to purple, and your guys are fighting between the buildings then. And so that's just, uh, if you have a unit with a CQC machine gun, that machine gun comes into play in the building, the building action, and that gives them an advantage. Also, you see, CQC machine guns have stabilizers, which means they can be used while this unit is moving, though at a hefty accuracy penalty. The Moto Strelke have to be stationary to fire their machine gun. They can't move at all, otherwise it just won't fire. Um... Briefly, we'll mention panic effects. Um, you'll probably notice that when you play the game, in infantry and anything really has a morale. It like starts at calm and then goes to worried and, and so on until you get to panicked. And then when you're panicked, it's it's red. And each progressive uh, level of, of uh, morale effects has like an increasing detrimental, I guess, mal bonus. I don't know. It's not good. <laughs> um, so what it'll do is mainly it'll reduce accuracy, reduce rate of fire, and reduce reload. So for example, at panicked, the Moto Strelke might only fire, say, two rounds per minute on their RPG with only 10% accuracy. So panic effects are pretty important to avoid. Though, it, I mean, especially with infantry combat, it's just, it's just gonna happen. You can't necessarily get around it. But if you see a unit that's panicked, for example, in city fighting, and then have a calm unit behind it, maybe pull out the panicked unit so you can recover and put the calm unit in its place to increase your combat effectiveness. Um, let's also talk about transports. Um, you see infantry come with transports. They have this little tab below their name that tells their transports. You see each each infantry has like this two out of two here, which means you can take two Gorno Strelke in your deck, two different cards of Gorno Strelke. And they also have these transports. This is 3 out of 3 MI8 MTV, uh, 3 out of 3 MI24A. What that means is that you can only have like 3 of this particular transport in this deck, so, um, like both of these counters are, are progressive and the MI8 will apply to all their units, not just the Gorno Strelke. So you could take, for example, 2 units of Gorno Strelke and, and an MI8 and then a VDV and an MI8, but then you wouldn't have any other, uh, can take any other MI8 TVs, that particular MI8. Also, it's important to note that um, depending on the transport, and usually the better the transport, the worse it is, uh, you can reduce the availability in your infantry card. For example, these Moto Strelke 90 can only take 9 train. It's hard to see that because it's gray, but you can go look for yourself in the armory. Because they take this really expensive infantry fighting vehicle, whereas if you take Moto Strelke 90 and just the BTR 80, you can take 22 trained. So those are the extreme examples, uh, the most, the most available and the least available. That's just something to keep in mind when you're choosing a transport. Um, and then one thing I do want to talk about that I can't show in the Soviet deck. Um, there's something called a fist squad, and that, that's like what these guys are right here. I think FIST is like fire support team or something. I'm not totally sure on the acronym, but basically they have this kind of orange background in their unit card, and uh, they're five-men squads usually with uh, like a machine gun or an assault rifle and then a anti-tank weapon. And so this particular anti-tank weapon, 
as opposed to regular anti-tank weapons from regular infantry. This has two HE. It's a Carl Gustav M2 with two HE. This is a Carl Gustav M2 on just infantry, and it has no HE. So what does that mean? It means that this Maw squad can actually fire their Carl Gustavs at enemy infantry. And so you might think, oh, that makes them excellent for uh, killing other infantry. And yeah, you can use them for that. But what this doesn't tell you is that these units actually have a 350 meter minimum range on their RPG, <clears throat> below which they cannot fire at enemy uh, infantry. And why is that? What does 350 mean? Well, 350 meter range happens to be the maximum range which you can engage at in a forest. And the reason they added that minimum range is because people were just spamming these squads in forests and having them kill everything with their fast firing, uh, high suppression weapons. And so <clears throat> I, I still see a lot of people use blobs of these units in forests, and you really shouldn't. They're, they're only going to be able to target tanks. They can't kill infantry. <clears throat> and um, this will go back to USSR. I have way too many decks. Uh, let's see, support. Um, there's really two kinds of support units. There's artillery and there's um, anti-air. And so we'll start with artillery. And uh, with artillery, um, for example, the, the rate of fire, you have the Malka unit here, and it's got three rate of fire, three rounds per minute. And how do they get that? Well, the Malka takes 30 seconds to fire, and then it fires its one shell at the 30-second mark. And then once it's aimed and fired, it takes 15 seconds to fire a subsequent shell, and then another 15 seconds. So 30 plus 15 plus 15 is 60 seconds. That's where they get their three rounds per minute from. Um, supply cost for artillery. Each artillery piece has a supply cost, which is uh, determined by the caliber of its uh, gun or its rocket. So, for example, the Malka has 203 millimeter ammunition, and that costs about 200 supplies to resupply. Uh, the Akatsias, by comparison, have 152 millimeter ammunition, and that takes, I believe, 70 supplies to resupply. And there, there's no way to tell that based on a unit card. You just have to test it for yourself. And but that that would be an, a useful thing to know how how supply intensive a given artillery unit is. Um, aim time is also a big factor in artillery, and that's also another thing you can't tell on the unit card. Um, these units, like the Akatsia and the Malka, they take 30 seconds to fire, meaning they take, you click on the ground, and then 30 seconds they have to aim, they have to decide their trajectory, yeah, I don't know. And then after 30 seconds goes by, then they start their barrage. But there are certain units that have what's called advanced fire control, like, for example, the Mista which only takes six or seven seconds to fire, which is an enormous advantage. And there's no way to really tell if you have that or not unless you test it for yourself. Uh, generally, advanced fire control units are about 130 points or so. They're very expensive, and rightly so. Unfortunately, the Malka did not rate an advanced fire control system. But uh, some other units that have this, like the American Paladin, the French Caesar, um, there, there are a few out there. Um, they're really good to have, just gotta test for yourself whether you have them or not. And then, um, well, also mortars. Mortars are a little different, they, they don't take 70 seconds to fire, obviously, they only take a few seconds to start firing, just because they're so small caliber. Uh, you see every, oops, every artillery unit has, well not everyone, all of the tube artillery have something called smoke, SMK, this little attribute here on the gun. You know, what that means is that if you press B and then fire position, you will um, put down a little puff of smoke instead of a high explosive round that then blocks line of sight, conceals movement. would really recommend everybody try and use smoke and make, make the best of it, because it's a really useful tool and I, I don't see enough of it. Uh, continue with artillery. What about rocket artillery? There's two broad types of rocket artillery, and it's exemplified here in the Soviet Uragon and the Soviet Smirch. You see they're both very uh, expensive, very high-performing uh, MLRS, which is an abbreviation for rocket launchers. And the main difference is that the Smirch fires uh, AP power, AP rockets, and the Uragon fires HE rockets, high-explosive rockets. 
And what this means is that the Smirch can kill tanks and light vehicles pretty well, but it won't hurt infantry at all. and Not at all. Not a single infantryman will be killed if he gets barraged by a Smirch. This is as opposed to a Uragon, which will do damage to everything, but not very much to armored targets and then more to the least armored targets. So infantry that are underneath a Smirch rocket will pretty much be screwed. That's just something to keep in mind when you're picking a rocket launcher. You know, what kind of rounds is it firing? What do I need this for? There are even some rocket launchers that fire napalm rockets, and that's another interesting uh, quality to have. Um, let's see. Oh, and dispersion. Dispersion is the last thing for artillery. Dispersion is a value here, which um, I believe it's just the meters squared that are inside of your aiming reticle when you're trying to fire this. And basically the lower dispersion the better, like this Arkatsia is extremely inaccurate whereas this Malka is extremely accurate just because the dispersion is much lower. And um, and sometimes you might even want a larger dispersion, like if you have an Akatsia and you want to just saturate an area with a horde of these versus a Malka which is more precision scalpel. Something to keep in mind when selecting uh, um, artillery. And then uh, anti-air It's the other part of the support section, and I think the biggest thing would be just the distinction between infrared and radar. You see um, this little R up here in the corner of the unit icon means it's radar. And also, like, the, this book here, see its weapon has the radar trait, RAD, whereas it says radar missiles well, whereas the Strela 10M has infrared missiles. And the main difference is that um, radar are generally more accurate, further firing, and harder hitting, but they're also vulnerable to a very specific unit called SEED, S-E-A-D, Suppression of Enemy Air Defenses. And SEED is an, a, a type of aircraft that fires missiles that target just radar pieces. And so this book, if it has its missiles on, will be targeted by the SEED and killed, like usually outside of its effective range. And so they're very vulnerable and they require a lot of micromanagement. Whereas the infrared, there's nothing that targets them specifically. They're very safe and easy to use. But, like I said, shorter range, less accuracy, less damage. Um, also an important concept is reload time. Strela 10M, for example, has 10 seconds of reload time. And you might think, well, does that mean it fires one missile and then it has to take 10 seconds to fire another one? Well, no, it actually, you can see here it has kind of a launcher on the top with four discrete tubes. Um, and what that means is that it can fire all four of those, just one after another. And then once it fires all four of those, then it reloads. It takes ten seconds for them to put extra missiles inside the, the tubes again and be ready to go. Likewise, a unit like the book, it has four missiles on the, on the model here. And it can fire all four, and then once you're done resupplying it, it'll take like 30 seconds for them to load all those missiles back and have them ready to fire, I guess. Uh, and then units like, for example, the Tunguska here, it's probably hard to see on the video, but it actually has eight different tubes on the side, and it has eight missiles in its uh, inventory, so it can fire all eight without reloading. Um, and there's no way to really tell that. You know, you just you just have to look at the model and decide for yourself how many tubes or how many emplacements it has and then that's generally a good indication of how many missiles it can fire before having to reload. <clears throat> and just like artillery, like each particular missile has its own supply cost that you have to determine for yourself with testing. Uh, oh, and also, um, where is it? Strela 10M. There's also another trait I want to mention which is um, there's like a guided, this missile is guided, the operator needs to stand still and aim at the target until impact, and fire and forget, and the the difference is mainly what you'd think, I mean, guided missiles just means that the book has to sit there and be looking at its target until the missile impacts. If the book gets killed, if it moves, if it gets stunned, the missile will miss, likely. Whereas the Strela 10M, once it fires its missile, the missile's gone. It doesn't matter what happens, it's either going to hit or it's not going to hit based on the accuracy. It's, if the Strela 10M dies right after it fires its missile, that has no effect on the missile. Um, we'll move on to tanks. Oh, tanks is probably the biggest section. Um, there's, well, 
I guess we'll just start with this. There's um, basically two types of damage that a tank can do. There's KE, which is kinetic energy, and heat, which is high explosive anti-tank. Um, and the difference is how the damage for these weapons work and how it scales. Um, for example, KE, kinetic, tells you that um, the closer this unit will get to the target, the higher the AP value will rise. And what that actually means is that for every, um, this range is in increments, so for every 175 meter increment you get closer to your target from your max range, your AP will go up by one. So you'll gain, this has 2275 meter range. If it were, if it were to fire at something from tw um, 2100 meter range, it would be firing with 19 AP effectively instead of the stated 18. This is as opposed to heat, which has the rather nice effect of dealing a minimum of one damage no matter what range, what AP, or what armor it's attacking. But it also doesn't scale up. Um, and the formula for how to calculate its damage works a little differently as well. Uh, heat does times two damage to zero armor targets, and it does the stated damage on, on one armor target. So if this fires at a target with one armor, it'll do 22 damage. And then after that, a formula comes into effect. And I'll actually post a spreadsheet in the, the description of this video, which will have a lot of that information on it, how to calculate these different values or whatnot. Um, then I, I guess, let's see, I need to find one. There's also two different types of missiles. Um, you see the guided trade is back, where the tank has to guide its missile to its target. It can't move, it can't be killed. Uh, and there's also a semi-active trait. Some tanks have this where they can fire a semi-active missile, and they can actually move while they're firing. Now, if they die, if they get stunned, whatever, the missile can still miss then. It'll still, they have to actually be guiding their missile. It's just, they don't have to stand still. And if you move while you're firing your missile, your missile accuracy will drop from 45% to the stabilizer value of 30%. But if you uh, stop again before the missile hits, the accuracy will go back up. So when you're firing a missile, you might want to try and micromanage that. Um, let's see. Accuracy, um... It also goes up at every 175 meter increment. The accuracy goes up by 5%. So again, this tank has 2275 meter range. If you were to fire at something from 2100 meters away, this accuracy would actually be 60%. Um, veterancy aside, because veterancy also increase ac increases accuracy. Uh, and then tanks also, like the main gun, has AP and HE power, which is armor penetration and high explosive. High explosive deals damage to infantry, and it does not scale upwards with range, even though this is a kinetic energy uh, weapon. Um, what this means is basically if you have an infantry squad with 10 men, and you shoot them with this gun, there will only be 6 men left. You will do 4 damage, and then 4 damage, and then another 4 damage. Uh, that's usually the case now if a unit's like in a building in cover or sometimes you have a rare critical where you get a near miss or a near hit. Uh, the damage can go down, but generally you're going to do four damage per shot to infantry squads when you're using a HE gun like this. Uh, let's see. There's also, I talked a little bit about it with morale effects like panicked. And the biggest... Uh, worry for tanks when they get in panic is actually their rate of fire going down and uh, I mean it, it can be a pretty big deal like uh, in Abrams with 9 or 10 rate of fire will only fire at maybe 2 or 3 rate of fire if they're panicked and the advantage of a lot of Soviet tanks is they have something called an auto loader. What that means is that there's actually not a guy in the tank loading shells into the barrel and firing them. It, it's actually mechanically done so the machine doesn't get panicked, it does its job no matter what, so it, the rate of fire does not fall as you get panicked. Uh, there's no way to tell if a unit has an auto loader without just looking it up online or something. There's Generally, I think every Soviet tank above T-64 BV has an auto loader. I think um, some NATO tanks do as well, like the Leclerc and the Q Maru. But, I mean, this is a huge advantage if you can always fire at 9 rate of fire even when panicked and maybe your enemies have really decreased their rate of fire a lot as a result of being panicked. Definitely keep that in mind. Uh, size is another important effect on a tank, and really any unit. 
There are five discrete values of size. There's a uh, very small, small, medium, large, and then very large. And how it works is that medium is the average. It has no real effect, but uh, small will actually decrease your chance to hit by 5%, and then very small by 10%. And then vice versa, uh, large increases your chance of being hit by 5%, and very large increases it by 10%. So it's a sliding scale. Um, let's see. Stealth, also probably important. Um, it's generally not, not very good on anything except recon, so maybe I'll talk, talk about that in the recon section more. Uh, fuel and autonomy, you see, um, the autonomy, it's, I don't know where they got this number, 450 kilometers, cause that's enough to go back and forth on most maps several times. Basically, the lower the autonomy, the worse you are, you, um, you want higher autonomy, and that's just a measure of how quickly your tank runs out of gas and then will be stuck in its position until it gets refueled. And then the fuel gauge, this 20, 40 liters of fuel, that's kind of an arbitrary number. Um, it's just how much it takes to resupply this tank, and some tanks are more fuel efficient than others. So, for example, this T-80UM has uh, 2,040 liters of fuel in its tank. If this tank were completely empty and you sent, um, like one of these supply trucks to get it, like this Ural, it would take basically two of these trucks to fully refuel just the fuel tank on that, on that T-80UM. So, I mean, you might want to go green on your decks and, and be careful with fuel efficiency. Uh, it can be a real pain to have your tanks run out of gas when you're in the middle of the fight. Um, armor I should talk about. Basically, there are four different uh, armor values that just uh, like pertain to a side of the tank. So, for example, this tank has 20 front armor. Any uh, shell or target that, that hits on the front will uh, be dealing with 20 armor. And then sides, predictably, are over here. So if you get a side shot, that's much less armor. And then a rear shot, they have almost no armor on the rear, so... I mean, that's pretty obvious with tanks. You never want to attack them frontally. If you can help it, you always want to try and flank them and get nice side shots. Um, the only thing is uh, top armor, which I mentioned earlier with the command tanks, but this tank has three top armor. And what top armor protects you against is artillery and bombing, for the most part. And um, that's, that's just useful to have... Um, should, I should note that ATGM planes, planes that actually fire anti-tank missiles, do not hit top armor. They hit whatever armor they're facing, so either side, front, or back. But uh, bombs dropped by planes do hit the top armor. Um, let's see. Oh, and prototype. Prototype is just... Uh, it's not very important anymore, but basically it just means this is a cutting-edge unit, and you generally only get one card of prototype units, whereas you get maybe two or three cards of non-prototype units. It also means that you can only take um, prototypes in a national deck or coalition that has this nation's units. So, for example, um, Soviets don't have a coalition, but you can only take this unit in a Soviet deck because it's a prototype. And also, I should mention, strength is just essentially um, health points. So you have 10 health points before you die. Uh, let's see, recon. Um, the most important value on a recon unit is optics. See here, optics exceptional. That That's the best value. It goes from, like I think, poor to bad, or bad to poor, and then eventually medium, good, very good, exceptional. And uh, basically, if it's a recon unit, it's going to have good or better optics. And if it's not a recon unit, it'll have medium or, or less optics. And there's pretty significant jumps in the performance. Like, good is just a little bit better seen than a regular unit. Very good is much better than exceptional optics. Is just, like, it's really good. Like, you, you want exceptional optics recon in your deck if you can have it. Uh, for example, I think exceptional optics can see stuff across a clear field about five kilometers away, and then it can see into forest something like two kilometers away, depending a lot on the stealth and the size of what you're trying to look at. Um, it's just it's very important. I would always take exceptional recon if you can. Not not every unit is exceptional, but uh, like I have two in my deck: uh, re exceptional helicopter and exceptional vehicle, and then. This, these guys are very good, and this guy's very good. Uh, generally avoid good optics unless you can help it, because they're not 
as so uh, high performing. Uh, stealth is a value I mentioned earlier. You see recon actually has higher than average stealth. Um, any recon unit has a higher stealth value than its normal uh, an equivalent. So for example, this T-55 has medium stealth. If you were to look at the tank lineup of the T-55, it would only have poor stealth. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that the T-55 can actually fire from cover and not be spotted as much. This isn't as important for this unit because its gun is so crappy, but for example, the Americans have a reconnaissance Bradley with stealth that fires TOW-2 missiles that are very powerful, and being able to shoot them without being seen is a really good asset. Um, basically, what determines whether or not you're detected is a kind of mix of your unit's stealth, the enemy's optics, whatever can potentially look at it with its optics, and something called noise. And noise is something a unit makes whenever it fires its weapon. So, for example, this tank sitting in a bush might not be seen, but then when it fires its weapon, it makes a noise and the enemy can see it. And if the noise value of your gun is uh, is less than like the stealth of your unit uh, plus the enemy's optics, then you aren't revealed, and that's just there's just a dice roll every time that happens. And, uh, yeah, it's just if you ever see a unit not, like, firing at you from a tree line, you go, oh, why can't I see it? It's because you don't have good enough optics to see it. It doesn't make very loud noises when it fires, or it has very nice stealth. That's just a little explanation about how that works. Um, let's see. And then there's vehicle section. There's not really much to talk about in the vehicle section. It's really kind of a miscellaneous area. Uh, the one thing I did want to cover was actually flame tanks. Uh, these tanks have a napalm trait, which means that they'll actually put down like a gout of fire, and then it'll set like a, a part of the ground on fire, and it can be an area of denial weapon, or or to burn a city alive, whatever it might be. And the way you want to use these is just fire positioning them, rather than wait for them to select a target and fire it like normally. And that just allows you more efficient use and quicker use of your napalm. Uh, helicopters, there's quite a bit to talk about. Um, I want to show like the difference between these two units. Um, actually, I want to get rid of that so you can see. These are basically the same helicopter. The only difference is um, the Mi-24P has four less missiles, and its gun is a little different. And what do I mean? Well, this is the Mi-24P. You see it's got these uh, two kind of black barrels mounted on the side, and that's actually its gun. This is as opposed to the uh, Mi-24VP, which has this kind of pivoting little uh, gun emplacement on the nose. Now, this means that if you're using the Mi-24P, you actually have to be facing directly at your target to use its gun. Like, you'll go to a target, and then you'll kind of do a little somersault as you try and point directly at the target, and then you'll fire. Whereas the Mi-24VP, it just goes right up to the target and sees it, and then opens fire um, just right away, even before it has to start maneuvering. And that's just really useful. It gives you a lot of uh, utility with your gun to fire quicker, fire more accurately. Generally, like if you have a helicopter, you want to try and have it with one of these mounts that pivots like this. Uh, certain units like the Apache, the Cobra, the Mi-24Ps, they have this, whereas some others don't. And generally the ones that don't, their cannons aren't very useful, except in situations where there's like no enemy air defenses at all. Just something to keep in mind. Also, uh, it's interesting to note that this unit has a semi-active missile. I think I mean, almost all, or even all helicopters have semi-active missiles now, and they used to have guided <clears throat> meaning that you can fire these missiles while your helicopter is in flight, but uh, the accuracy drops to 40% as opposed to the normal 55%. Um, let's see. Uh, rockets, kind of an interesting thing. You can fire positioned rockets just like artillery to saturate an area. Maybe if you know units are there, but you can't see them yet. <clears throat> and then um, anti-aircraft choppers. Uh, like the Mi-24V has eight IGLA missiles on the... Well, you actually can't see them because Eugen was lazy and didn't model them, but it has uh, IGLA missiles, which are anti-aircraft missiles. And um, basically th these work a lot like the gun we talked about on the, on the Mi-24P, where the helicopter has to face your target so it'll actually fly towards the target and then do a kind of dance as it tries to orient to 
face its missile pods to whatever it's aiming at. And so sometimes when you're using anti-aircraft helicopters, you just want to stay still and let them come to you because your helicopter will be ready to fire quicker because he doesn't have to try and counteract his forward momentum to then tilt back and face his nose. He'll, he'll be ready to go quicker. <clears throat> and uh, planes, let's see. Planes, there's several different types. Like this is an air superiority fighter, an ASF. You can read that in this little icon up here. And, and this plane is just for killing enemy planes and to a lesser extent helicopters. That, that's all it does. Um, it has a few interesting stats like uh, time on target or time over target. It says 100 seconds. It basically means once you call this unit out, you have 100 seconds before it runs out of fuel and, and goes back to base. Uh, just and then it'll all obviously refuel. And you can call it back later once it finishes refueling. Another interesting value is ECM, electronic countermeasures, and that's actually a substitute for size. You see, planes don't have size. And basically, the higher the ECM is, the the better, because you'll be you'll have less of a chance of being hit. For example, this Su-27PU has 50% ECM. That means that if a 60% accuracy missile fires at it, it only has effectively a accuracy of 30% when shooting at this particular unit. So obviously high ECM is very desirable for planes. It adds a lot of survivability. Uh, another concern when picking ASFs is um, these long-range missiles. Let's see, 77-meter range, 7,000-meter range. These long-range missiles are very important, but there's an attribute you want to pay attention to. And that is um, the SU-27S has a semi-active missile, and the SU-27PU has a fire-and-forget missile. Now, I talked about these two values a little bit earlier, but basically this means that the SU-27S has to be facing its target for its missile to hit, because remember, it's guiding the missile. And uh, it basically has, I think, a 90-degree cone of sight, where if you turn outside of that 90 degrees before the missile hits, then the missile will miss. Also, if your plane gets stunned, killed, etc., evacs, then the missile can also miss as well. So be aware. It's because of that that the SU-27PU is a lot better fighter because of these fire and forget missiles. It can fire its missiles quicker, and then once the missiles are off, they're either going to hit or they're not going to hit. What happens to the SU-27PU afterwards doesn't matter. And so, like I said, you really want to have these fire and forget long-range missiles whenever you can get them. Um, there's also a plane called a multi-role. You can see multi-role combat aircraft. And what this basically means is that it's a plane that has mainly ground attack capabilities with a few maybe defensive uh, missiles. Generally, don't use these planes as like true multi-roles. You, you don't want to send these up against real air superiority fighters because it's just not going to work 9 times out of 10. Only do that in an emergency or when you have a really good advantage, um, really good advantageous position on an enemy plane. You know, this is a ground attack aircraft. It has an AP gun for killing tanks. It has 16 uh, armor penetration missiles and only two anti-aircraft missiles. So don't don't use this against ASFs unless you really have to. Now, there are a few true multi rules There's only about three of them in the game, but they do exist. Uh, one of them is the Su-27PU. You see it's got these really powerful anti-tank missiles, but then it also has these long-range anti-aircraft missiles like the SU-27PU had. And so this plane really can attack enemy planes and do so effectively. It, it really is a true multi-role. Most multi-roles are not, but if you can get a multi-role that has these, like another one would be the MiG-29, which is... Where is it? Am I blind? Here it is. See, this one also has those long-range uh, missiles, and it's a cluster bomber. So this would be a multi-role. Its, uh, it's little brother, which only has the much shorter-range missiles, would not be a multi-role. I mean, it's called a multi-role, but don't don't use it as a multi-role. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing. <laughs> um, and the last thing I really want to talk about with planes is seed. I mentioned this earlier when I talked about uh, radar um, anti-air. And um, you see this This is a seed aircraft that has seed, suppression of enemy air defense. It has the seed trait on its uh, missiles. This anti-radiation missile will lock on enemy radar and be guided to them as long as they remain active. And so um, if you have like a, a book or an IHawk or something with the radar trait, these missiles target only those units, only the missiles with the radar trait, and only when they're turned on. And so 
Because of how long range and how accurate these missiles are, they're really good for killing enemy air defense or even just persuading your opponent to turn them off while you uh, do a bombing run. And so kind of that, that's what Seed is for. If you see them in the air, turn your radar off. The hotkey for turning uh, weapons off is H, the default hotkey. H is in hot dog. And um, that was a really strange <laughs> word to choose. I'm sorry. Uh, H is in heaven. And uh, yeah, so that's a good way to turn your air um, anti-air on and off really quickly and manage it better. And wow, I, th I think that's pretty much it for um, for uh, the the planes. Uh, there, I guess I would mention that like there's two different types of bombs. There's cluster bombs and HE bombs, just like with rockets. So uh, this bomber has six AP. This bomber has eleven HE. So this one hurts tanks and vehicles, this one hurts vehicles and infantry, so pick the right one for the job. Uh, generally cluster bombs aren't very good, it, it's better to use missiles than cluster bombs, and then HE bombs are very good. So, Wow, that's the video. Um, did I miss anything? Was there something else you wanted to ask me? Well, leave it in the comments. Um, hopefully the sound volume on this one is a little bit better. I know the last one was quiet, so I'll re-upload this and hope for the best. Uh, tell me what you think, and I, I hope you enjoy this tutorial video. Uh, please remember, like, comment, subscribe, whatnot. And yeah, thanks for watching. This is Raven signing off.